Hi, I'm Lauren Wilson. I am an accountant in Flagstaff, Arizona, and I am currently training for the California International Marathon on December 4th, 2022. So it's officially October 2nd. So we're officially nine weeks out from the race. And I just wanted to share some of my training with y'all and then also go over some, some stride pod data. So the stride pod here is a power meter for runners. So power has been really big in the cycling community for a while for pacing purposes, because your heart rate, there's a lot of different variables that can affect your heart rate, such as how you slept the night before your hydration status, let's just say you have a surge of adrenaline. So it's a lagging factor um, in terms of the, the fatigue levels as well, because there's heart rate drift in terms of it takes time for the heart to adapt um, to a load. Whereas with power, right? So your heart rate can go all over the place depending on, on all those factors. Whereas your power is how much work you are doing which is um, going to be how much watts of power are you putting out, and right? So if you go up a hill or if it's windy outside or other factors that might affect your pacing and your heart rate, your power is a real-time indicator, right? Because your power is going to be measured with each step on each output in watts. So you have a real-time insight into your pacing, but then also your, your effort levels and maybe the thresholds you're running at. So I'm just trying to, to get some good data here. So yeah, let's go ahead and delve on in. So I'm on my Strava. And then also have my Stride Power Center here. Another thing, I guess, is I my PR for the marathon is 236.59 at the LA marathon. And then I've also run a 237 low at the, the Boston marathon. So those, those are my two best marathon times. I've also run a couple ultras. I've run the Flagstaff to Grand Canyon 100 miler and 17 hours, 30 minutes, which was uh, like a top, top five time all time. And then I've also at the Brazos Bend 100, I did end up dropping out at mile 87 with rhabdomyolysis, but I went through 50 miles in sub six hours. So five hours, 57 minutes, went through hundred K at a, like a low seven minute per mile average clip. I'm also a um, personal trainer, uh, group fitness instructor, coach, or I was, I was all that stuff. Now I'm an accountant, but Right. So I, I was working out in the field. I was moving around a lot. I was doing these things. Now, as an accountant, I'm at a desk job. And, and while I have an adjustable desk, it has affected my, my training and it's affected my body, amongst other factors. And my motivation behind sharing my training is as a desk worker now, I kind of understand how a lot of y'all are feeling out there. Whereas before, when I was a coach, I was active all day. So I, while I had an understanding theoretically of what was going on in an individual's body that worked at a desk all day, now I actually have real world practical experience. And I just want to share what, what I'm doing because the first year as an accountant, I was going through a lot of lower leg issues, a lot of ankle pain, a lot of Achilles pain and a lot of foot pain. And I still kind of battled that a, a little bit but I've been able to do some different exercises and, and structure my training a little bit differently to, to accommodate for that. And so I just want to share my experience with you guys. And if you get any benefit from it, that would be awesome, but also just start the conversation because if we can crowdsource on how we can still work our desk jobs and, and make a good money, but also be physically active and physically fit and healthy, I think that's a win-win situation. So that's my goal for, for this series um, of analyzing my data. So yeah, nine weeks out, a little bit of context here. I was doing like 13 to 14 milers all summer. And then I had a three week build where I went from 13 up to 16 miles, up to 18 miles, up to 20 miles, 
with Hills involved. And then this week I dropped it back down to, to 18.4. And the goal is to build the volume of the, of the long run back up. And my long run right now is about, see, I'm doing about 50 to 55 miles a week right now. And as you can see, 18 to 20, what would that be? Just real quick, if I was uh, like 35%, 40%. Um, of my of my long of my weekly mileage is, is in my long run, which is a substantial amount, I would uh, admit. Um, but due to again the nature of my job and the nature of those lower leg injuries and, and the fact the marathon is so aerobic, I get a lot of walking mileage in, a little bit of cycling mileage in, and I'll get some cardio from weights and doing some physical therapy exercises as well. And so these long runs do fatigue me. They do put a lot of strain on my body. So during the week, I'm not doing as much, almost like a true weekend warrior. So yeah, as you can see, 18.4 miles, 628 pace. The goal going into this workout was to do three by 10K loop. So if you look at the map here, you can see that map kind of highlighting. So three by 10K loop, we had a vehicle right here with water, electrolytes and goo. And the, the, the goal was to get a little bit faster each loop. So start off at like a more easy pace, go into a moderate pace, which I would say is about marathon pace plus or minus five to 10, five seconds or so. And then a, a hard pace, which would have been sub marathon pace uh, by five, 10, 15 seconds was the goal. Ended up not working out like that. So as we can see, pace, on the left and then I have my grade adjusted pace here and then if I open up my stride power data you can see I have my power right here on the left and then we have form power form power ratio and ground contact time so really it's power form power ratio and ground contact time are the metrics we're going to look at but first here Right, started off relatively uh, good. So we did start at 8.30 in the morning. It was later than I wanted, but I didn't want to run by myself. So I train a lot with my roommates and best friends who also are, are, are runners. And yeah, so we started a little bit late, and it, but it was still nice when we started about 50 degrees or so. Ended up being about 70 degrees by the end, which isn't hot if you're down at sea level, but when you're in Flagstaff at 7,000 feet, you add in 7,000 feet, you add dirt, you add rolling hills, and then you start to add the, the temperature. That's just a lot of extra strain on the body. So yeah, started off relatively easy, great adjusted pace here. And as you can see, we already by the third mile started bringing the, the pace down, but we were feeling really, really good um, all in all. So this first loop here, right? I went to 643, 636, 626, 623, 620. So a little bit of insight. These first two miles are gradual. First two and a half miles are all gradual uphill. And you can see that in the gap. I got a 14 second gap there and a 14 second gap on the second mile. And then it starts to roll down a little bit. Then it goes back up a, a tiny little bit, um, towards the end. But yeah, Going over here, you can see my power kind of correlated with that increase in pace, 264, 273, 275, 276. So I like to split every two miles, so 275 through that first loop. Form power ratio, so this is your efficiency while you're running. So when you run, right, you hit the ground and you create a, um, a, a, a ground reaction force, but then also the elastic force through the, the muscles and, and the tendons in the leg. And so when you put force into the ground, what your efficiency ratio is, is how much of that power you're producing, how much of the watts that you're producing is returned into creating vo forward velocity or forward momentum or, or running, right? How much of it is it actually returned into the running motion and then how much of it is lost, right? Is how much dis dissipates into the ground or is, is used to stabilize your body rather than 
to put you forward. Because if you have a lack of stability, then you're not going to be able to absorb the force and use that force to go forward. You're using the force to, to stabilize on one leg. So 20, 0 0.24, 0 0.24, 0 0.24. And according to the stride itself, if you want to go to their website, they have all of this explained, but they say that right here, 20 to 20, 23 to 25% form power ratio is about average. So I'm in about average range on, on the efficiency on, on dirt though. So I do like the fact right on dirt, because I'm already going to be less efficient than if I was on pavement. Uh, so I'll take that right about right there. If I was good, get down to 23, then I, then I would be good. Um, let's go back over here. So right first loop gradually got faster, feeling good. And then I entered into those gradual uphills again. You can see that gap 11 seconds, see that gap 15 seconds. So still, still got faster, right? Because if I did 656, 643, then I did 626, um, 632. So significantly faster there. And then a 264 to a 276. So I was executing the plan of trying to get faster progressively. So maybe while the the paces did indicate it, right? Because I'm comparing apples to apples the first two miles of this first loop to the first two miles of that next loop. And then my power also went up. So I was executing well. My efficiency also went up um, to 0.23. So that's good. The lower the number, the, the better on the form power ratio. And then as you can see, my power started to, to decrease a little bit on those next two miles. So probably after this first 10K, got excited, started to push the pace, not taking into account that the gradual uphill for two and a half miles with all the other variables of altitude and heat and everything and dirt uh, was going to fatigue me, fatigue me more than I, than I would have liked that early in the run. And you can see that on these next two miles, 635, 627, the gap starts to, to go in the opposite direction. And then my power actually drops back down. So I'm starting to, to fatigue a little bit earlier than I would have liked, considering it's only eight miles in, I'm not even halfway in. So not so far, not the, not a bad execution, but not the best execution, but I'll talk a little bit more about that here. And then started to, to rally a little bit, drop the pace back down. As you can see, my, my great adjusted pace and then my actual pace for the next two miles. I guess it was supposed to be nine and 10. And then I go back over here. So one, two, three, four, five right here. Oh, and then I started bringing it back up from 10 to 12, right? So back into that progressive mode, starting to, to, to rally a little bit, and then 279 watts. One, two, three, four, five, six. So this was the end. The 277 was the end of the, the second loop. So I am going to be 12 miles in or 20K in. So able to, to bring it back down. Um, these last two miles are a little bit downhill on that loop. Uh, I won't lie around that did take a lot of mental effort. So right. I was trying to get back to executing the, the workout and I wanted to expend that a little bit of mental, extra mental effort because I knew I was going to get water at, at mile 12 and refueled up. And I thought that I was going to be able to really pick up the pace and, and execute the, the plan of dropping the pace. I just truly felt like that. I did start to just feel that fatigue in the, in the back half of the second loop out of nowhere. And it goes back to what I was saying about all those different variables at altitude with the heat, with the dirt and everything and the rolling hills or gra gra gradual uphills. You start to fatigue earlier because you're breathing harder. You have to work harder to breathe because the air pressure up here isn't the same. So you don't process the oxygen as efficiently. And then when you respirate that hard, you're dehydrating more quickly than you would otherwise, right? So once you get dehydrated, it, it can really turn you upside down. And it's not about just the, the amount of liquid you're bringing in. 
it is the electrolyte balance, right? So sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium in balance with the water that's going to keep the muscles firing, keep the nervous system firing. And so when we talk about power and, and watt output, that's a thing to keep in mind is as soon as you start to get fatigued you're, you're, or, or dehydrated, now that electricity isn't being produced as efficiently and your body is going to increase heart rate, decrease power, and because the, the, again, because of the hydration and the mechanisms at work when you get um, dehydrated. So you want to get that back in, in front and keep on top of it. So right after that, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, started to bring it back up. So got the water in me, got the electrolytes, cooled off, put water on my, my head, my palms and my hands and my face because just um, cooling, right? Topical cooling of the body is, is one of the li biggest limiting factors in, in fatigue. Uh, they did studies at Stanford, I believe. I got that from the Huberman podcast where they put water on the palms in those, those different globular areas during a tricep dip test and an increased endurance 300 to 500%. So anyways, so I did 279 and then that took a lot of effort out of me. And as you can see, the watts started dropping 278, 273 and then able to rally for a 277, right? So I didn't have a 273 except for that first four miles when I was easing into it. So again, not the execution that I would like to see in the run. So a lot of people would say like, oh, well, maybe you should pull the plug once you, once you get off the pace. And that is one school of thought. And I think that at the elite level, if you're not hitting the pace, then yeah, by all means, cut the workout short, go recover. For us people that work desk jobs, there's other factors that we run besides just getting the physical prize. And a lot of it is a mental component, whether that's confidence, discipline, self-esteem. So stop the workout if you're going to get hurt from the fatigue. But if you can grind through mentally through, through a, maybe a deeper part than you would have wanted to, that's going to carry over into your, your relationships and your work life and, and everything else. Um, so yeah, there's that fine balance when you're not a pro athlete of, of why you finish workouts and maybe go deeper than you should in a given workout and, and, and recognizing that the holistic human, it's not just a physical game, it's a mental game. And if you need a mental check, then you have to go through. That's the only way you develop that mental strength. So yeah, for me, that's really what it came down to. As you can see, my gap started to slow down on both of those last miles. I was really starting to fatigue. You could see again, my, my watt output started to go down. But what I am proud of from this data, so while maybe I didn't execute the pacing appropriately, even though I personally think I just didn't hydrate and fuel correctly, which is why I'm sitting down with with another coach this week to, to bounce ideas off of each other and really get a nutrition plan dialed in. What I am proud of though, is this form power ratio, right? When I started to fatigue, I was at 0 0.24, 0 0.24 for a while. Then I got a couple 0.23s in. And then when I fatigued, I went 0.24, but I was able to bring it back down to a 0.23, which again is that good efficiency rating. And so as you start to fatigue, right, your form starts to break down. I'm very aware of where my weakness, <coughs> where my weaknesses are, excuse me, imbalanced in terms of my abdominal strength and my hip strength on both sides. <coughs> my left side is significantly weaker. And as a result, I've overused my right side of my body for a while. And as the right side starts to tighten up, the firing patterns from the nervous system, the movement patterns start to get more and more chaotic and less and less efficient. And so knowing that I'm able to, right, in, in the development of motor skills, when you're running, you're mostly in that unconscious competence stage. You're not thinking about your form so much if you're, if you're relatively efficient. 
But when you start to break down, if you know where those imbalances are, now you can start to direct conscious competence or conscious energy to maintaining that form. So I was able to right, tighten my core up, rotate my left shoulder back a little bit more and push my right hip back. So that's what happens is my right leg gets tight and, and my right pelvis starts to move, ro my pelvis rotates forward to the right, my spine uh, from right to left, I mean, rotates left. My spine starts to rotate right to counter that. And I know that's what happens when I fatigue. So again, rotating my spine back from the left to the right. And I push my pelvis back, right pelvis back into the left. So that's how I was able to maintain the efficiency and kind of regain that power too on that last lap because I know where my imbalances are and where I start to break down, I can start to direct conscious attention to it and maintain the, the form and everything. So, so yeah, I hope you got some value out of this. Again, this is a long run. I'm going to try to, to share more data, share more insights on my key workouts and on my long run efforts. And I will also share a little bit more of how I stay injury free how I train for marathons while working as a tax accountant. I'm not a CPA yet, but uh, I'm about to take the second part of the four part CPA exam, but it's like balancing those two things. And I truly believe that you don't, if you work a desk job and everything, it's not easy. Like it's definitely not easy to, to train for marathons and be that busy with a desk job. However, it is possible. And I, I want you to not have to sacrifice your health your mobility, your well-being, so uh, uh, for your job and vice versa. I don't want I don't want those to have to be competing interests per se. I think that you can do both at a very high level, and I hope that that I can live that out. And by living that out, other people can say I can do it too, and and we can really push each other to those high, greater heights. Um, not just athletically, but also just financially for for our economy. So yeah, uh, I'll be back next week. This was nine weeks out, California International Marathon. Next week will be eight weeks out. Also, I'll do like an interval workout or a tempo workout, talking to a coach this week. And then I'll do my long run video and it'll kind of be the same thing. Analyze the power, analyze the paces, tell you a little bit what was going on and just try to drop as much experience and, and knowledge that I can. And again, I'm not trying to tell you how to necessarily do anything. I just want to present evidence, present knowledge, present um, thought, and then you come up with something that works best for you or with your team. Later.